So many beautiful and poignant moments happened before the death of St. Therese. If her sister Marie hadn't written these moments down, we never would have known about them. In her book, My Sister St. Therese, we discover that there are many sufferings that Therese suffered that most people don't know about. For example, Therese died of tuberculosis, but did you know that she also died of gangrene? Celine writes, The sufferings of those last months defy description. Pulmonary tuberculosis, gangrene of the intestines, and large painful ulcers had reduced her emaciated body to a pitiful state, all the more appalling because of our utter powerlessness to help her. Months before her death, Therese suffered a hemorrhage of the lungs on Good Friday morning. Nevertheless, in spite of her condition, Therese asked and obtained the permission to continue the Carmelite Lenten regime with the same vigor as she had when she was well. Celine writes, Never dreaming that she had such a serious attack, I watched her admiringly as she carried out the whole observance of those last two days of the Holy Week. It was only later that I learned that the Black Fast had been particularly hard for her that year, but, as was her usual custom when life was hard, she had not complained. She continued to carry out her tasks as best as she could at Divine Office, which happened to be at an hour when her fever was at its worst. Also quite unknown were the treatments she received from her doctor. Celine tells us, It was heart-wrenching to see him use a cauterizing needle so freely on the wasted body of our little patient. One day, I counted more than 500 needle pokes. To add to this torture, as Therese would have to stand and lean over a table while he worked on her, he would converse with the mother prioress over trivial things. Therese later confided to Selene that she bore these ordeals by offering them up for the salvation of souls and by meditating on the sufferings of the martyrs. After these treatments, Therese would return to her cell, silent and trembling, sitting on the edge of the wooden plank of her bed, there to endure the after-effects of the treatment. Still, despite her sufferings, Therese retained a sweet serenity. Celine confessed that she was so puzzled over Therese's heroic cheerfulness that she wasn't sure that Therese was truly as sick as they thought, and perhaps they must be mistaken. Although she knew that Therese wasn't faking or exaggerating her illness, she couldn't understand how she had such peacefulness despite so much suffering. She decided that the next time Therese suffered an attack, she would know for sure if Therese truly was as ill as they thought. They didn't have long to wait. For as Celine writes, A little while later, when I saw her smiling angelically, I asked her the reason. Therese answered, It is because the pain in my side is very bad at present, but I have made it a point always to welcome suffering eagerly. One day, the doctor told Celine that she was to apply the cauterizing needles to Therese's back. Celine didn't want to do this, knowing how much pain it caused Therese. In fact, she suggested to Therese that they just skip the treatment for that day. Therese's answer? She said, I am afraid that if you omit the treatment, you will displease our mother, for she is a staunch believer in these cauterizations, especially on the back. When the doctor comes on Sunday, he will probably ask why we have not followed his directions. And so Celine gave the dreaded cauterization, which Therese later confessed to Marie that it was like a martyrdom for her. Interestingly, out of all these sufferings, it was milk that wore Therese down the most. A few months before her death, when she was unable to eat or drink anything at all, it was milk that was the only thing that would stay down, even though it gave her a terrible stomach ache. And so the doctor ordered a special kind of condensed milk for her to drink. And when she saw the bottles of milk brought into the infirmary, she began to cry bitterly. Celine writes, Later that afternoon, in order to rise above herself, she said plaintively, Please read me something from the life of a saint. My soul is in need of some strong food. I asked, Would you like something from St. Francis of Assisi? He'll entertain you with the stories about his little birds. Very seriously, she answered, No, not for entertainment, but to give me some lessons in humility. At one time, when Therese was having a hard time breathing and beginning to panic, she would moan, I am suffering, I am suffering. But then she would reproach herself for acting in this way, and she told Celine, Whenever I cry, I am suffering, you must say, so much the better. 
That is what I should like to say if I had the strength, so you can complete my aspiration for me. Selene agreed, although she said, cost what it might, I had to obey. I confess, however, that I avoided the occasion as much as possible. As her death neared, she once said to Selene in the midst of great suffering, Oh, my little sister Genevieve, pray for me to the Blessed Virgin. If you were sick, how I would storm heaven for you. But when it is for ourselves, it can be so daring. Then she sighed and said, How necessary it is to pray for the dying, if you only knew. On September 30th, Celine describes Therese's last day of suffering. On the afternoon of the day of her death, Mother Agnes and I were alone with her. Trembling and exhausted, she called us to help her. She was in pain from head to foot. Placing one of her arms on Pauline's shoulders and the other on mine, she was able to relax for a few moments. It was then that the three o'clock bell rang. Seeing our dear little victim with her arms in the form of a cross, we could only think of the crucified Jesus. Was not this little martyr his faithful image? Her long and terrible agony began shortly after when she could be heard repeating, Oh, it is pure suffering because there is not a drop of consolation. No, not one. Oh, my good God. Nevertheless, I love him. Oh, my good blessed virgin, come to my aid. If this is the agony, what must death be like? I assure you that the chalice is filled even to overflowing. Yes, my God, all that you wish, but have pity on me. No, I would never have believed that it was possible to suffer so much. Never, never. I can only explain it by my extreme desire to save souls. And tomorrow, it will probably be worse. Ah well, so much the better. It was heart-wrenching to hear her as she gasped these words. It was then that Mother de Zanga called the community. Trez was not able to speak, but received each nun with a gracious smile. Then, clasping her crucifix, she entered into the thoroughs of a dreadful agony. Her breathing was labored. She was drenched in a cold sweat, which soon saturated her linen and the bedclothes. She was trembling from head to foot. Sometime previously, Therese had said to us, My dear little sisters, please don't be distressed if my parting farewell is not directed to any one of you. Just what will happen at the last moment is in God's hands, of course. If he leaves the choice to me, however, my final adieu will be for my mother, because she is my prioress. On this evening of her death, therefore, as I placed a small piece of ice on Therese's parched lips, I received in return a beautiful smile. As she fixed a tender gaze on me, it seemed that she was looking into the future with all that it held for me. Her superhuman expression was full of encouragement and promise, as though she were saying to me, Go on with courage, my sling. I shall be with you. Believing that Sister Therese's parting adieu had not been for our mother but for me, the community was startled. But a moment later, Therese's half-veiled eyes, agonizing once more, traveled until they met those of Mother de Ganza, who was kneeling at her side. The latter, believing that the agony would be prolonged, dismissed the community, and the angelic patient, turning to her, said, Mother, isn't this the agony? Am I not going to die? On the response that God might wish to extend the time of her suffering, Therese sighed in a sweet and plaintive voice. Oh well, so be it, so be it. No, I would not want to suffer less. Then gazing on her crucifix, Oh, I love him. My God, I love you. These were her last words. Hardly had she uttered them. When, to our great surprise, she sank down on the pillow with her head a little to the right. Then suddenly, she raised herself up as though called by some mysterious voice, opened her eyes, and fixed a radiant gaze on a spot a little above the miraculous statue of Our Lady of the Smile. Therese remained in this position for some moments, about the time required to recite a credo slowly. At first, her expression had an air of confident assurance combined with a joyful attitude of expectancy as the story of her soul unfolded. 
she might have been asking God what he thought of it. And when he had his answer, her expression changed to one of profound astonishment and then to overflowing gratitude. I have always liked to believe that we were privileged to assist at Teresa's judgment. She had on the one hand been found worthy to appear before the Son of Man. On the other hand, she was, as it were, overcome by the realization of her bewildering reward, a glory which infinitely surpasses my boundless desires. This caused her whole being, I thought, to vibrate under the weight of so much love and in spite of her effort to withstand the continuous assault, she finally succumbed, closed her eyes and died. It was September 30th, 1897, at 7.20 in the evening. Submerged in grief, I fled from the infirmary and went outdoors. In my innocence, I was really hoping to catch a glimpse of her in the heavens, but as it was raining, the sky was completely overcast. Leaning against the column of one of the cloisters, I began to sob. If only the stars would come out, I thought to myself. Almost immediately, the clouds dispersed, and the stars were soon studying the sky. On the return journey home, my uncle and aunt, who had been praying in the outer chapel during Therese's agony, were also struck by this sudden change of weather, which enabled them so unexpectedly to close their umbrellas. Originally, Therese had wanted an inscription on her cross to say, I will spend my heaven doing good upon earth, but she hesitated for the sake of humility and prudence. Instead, a few lines of a poem that she wrote were inscribed. How I long, O my radiant star, to scatter thy beams afar. Remember that. However, when our workmen grasped the cross, the paint was still wet, and so the inscription was smudged. Mother Agnes took this as God's will and inscribed instead Therese's prophecy, I will spend my heaven doing good upon earth. A prophecy of her sainthood in that she really was rende tu petite, which means queen of the little ones. <laughs>